That means you don't become first on the agenda. It means that you have to move out the way. As my husband says, you got to die daily. Every day you have to take inventory on death in your life. The things in your life that are contradicting. And I look at myself a lot because I can see things that are not pleasing to God. And I don't want to keep those things in my life. It has to be a decision. And guess what? The decision has to be made every single day. Here's the catch. When they had their period of grace and, and graciousness from God being extended to them before the rain came, they had a lot of time to make up their mind. When they chose to negate what God had to offer them, notice something. There was no second chance. They had had all of their second chances for 120 years. They had 120 years of chances to change their mind and choose not to do so. What are you doing today? How many chances has God been giving you to change your mind and to do what's right before God? And you just keep on and keep on and keep on and keep on. Do you think that God is just going to let you continue in sin? See, this is, what, this, is when, this is when Paul says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Isn't that what he said? He wants you to understand something. You don't take the grace that God gives you and step on it. Don't think that when he gave you the mind and the heart to want to give your life to him and then make a public confession of it, that it was intended for you to turn around and play willy-nilly with it. That wasn't God's intention for your life. You know, the thing about it is, when Paul does a lot of his writings, he turns around at one point and says, but we're not of those that go back. But is that true for all of us? Because many of us have been baptized and we said we put on Christ, but we have actually gone back. What are you going back to? How is it what he offered you seemed good then and seems bad now? How is it that he cleaned you up and you just couldn't get enough of him then? But now you can't stand to be around him now. How is it you were happy to go down in his name and identify with him then? But now you hide and act like you don't even know who he is because you don't even know who you are. How do you make that kind of flip and feel comfortable? Because he speaks here that it is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. Now, the thing that's so interesting is when you come to the Lord and you repent, the first thing that you do is you clear your conscience through repentance. So when you went into the water... Your conscience was cleared, but now the act of acknowledging what you've done, the, act, the, the, the activity, the emblem that it represents is a physical permanent reminder to you that you know something? When I believed and was baptized, I cleared my conscience before God. Of what? Being a sinner? being a person of unrighteousness, being an individual that wasn't walking toward God but walking away from God. And if you've turned around today and you've made up in your mind to do that, don't let any demon in hell come along and entice you to turn your back on God and act like you don't know who he is. 
Because Paul also says that if you turn around and negate the grace of God, there's nothing else for you to put in its place. When you trample on this grace, when you turn around and treat God's grace and mercy like it is nothing, he says there's nothing else for me to give you to put you back on track. And I'm going to tell you something. Too many people in the church today live on the edge. We live on the edge to see just how much can we do and get by. And still feel as though I'm in good graces with God. And i got to clear my mind. I can close my eyes and go to sleep. Because let me tell you something. The devil's a shrewd operator. And this bad boy. He doesn't play for temporary. He plays for keeps. And he wants nothing more than your commitment and your public confession of faith to turn around and be a laughing stock and an embarrassment before the face of God. And you know why? Because the word of God says that when Jesus turned around and destroyed the works of the devil at Calvary, he said he made an open display of Satan. Do you not know Satan is still mad at God for what he did? And he gets no greater joy than to use the children of God to humiliate and put God down and make God look like he's nothing and give the devil the kudos of thinking that what he has to give us is greater than what God has already given us. And then when we walk on that edge, and then we're trying to see how close I can be. And let me tell you something. The question is, well, what can I do? How much liberty do I have? First of all, what you need to do is get close to the one you confess to. When you spend more time nestling up close to the one that you confess you are a partner with, when you start to nestle closer to the one who you were baptized into, and you, would, and you recognize that you have put on Christ. In other words, you took off your name that you had, that the, that the world supposedly gave you in a sense, and you have taken on his name. When I married Charles... The one thing that made him the happiest is that I went around and changed everything I had and put us three on it. He was so thrilled. <laughs> Every document just about I had, I don't think there's a document left that has anything on it but us three. And he just gets so proud because I carry his name. Well, do you know something? When you made that commitment and you said, I believe, and then you turn around, it's almost like when he and I got married, we made a commitment. Elder Jackson stood there and said, do you commit and vow to be faithful to him? Do you commit and vow to be faithful to her? He said yes to me. I said yes to him. And we all both said a yes to God. Amen? Amen. Now, when you don't keep that commitment that you made publicly, what have you now done? You put yourself in a position where you look like you're two-faced and you're a liar. Don't get mad at me. It's the truth. Now here you turn around and say, Lord, I believe and I'm, I want to be in your body. I want to be your bride. I want to be in, in Christ. And then you turn around and get in that water. And you make a confession that I want to be the bride of Christ. And the first time that something doesn't give you all you want and things don't work out the way you please and life turns around and shifts its momentum and circumstances don't quite go the way you want them to, the first thing you mean to tell me you're going to find to do is to dump on God? But that's what we do. We dump on God. I've done it. You've done it. From time to time, we will dump on our God. And then you know what we've got to do? We've got to readdress ourselves. We've got to readdress our thinking. We have to reevaluate where are we coming from and what are we doing and where am I headed and who am I married to? I told my husband, I said, I'm married to you on earth, but in glory, we won't be married. I'm always married to Jesus. And so are you. You will always remain married to Christ. And guess what? You can separate yourself from him in your 
actions. You see, your behavior separates...